UK and its future. I'm joined by a team of panelists who have a wealth of expertise and knowledge in this area that they're going to um, share with you. I think all of them would be uh, modest enough to say that they're not experts because experts in this field um, are usually the snake oil men. Um, but this evening we have um, Nick Rout, who is a trustee director and chairman of the East Anglian branch and a professional um, stalker. We've got Glyn Ingram, who is the British Deer Society's deer officer. We've got Grain Downing, who is a small scale venison producer. He's been very modest there um, and very professional about it. We have Will Oakley, who is a game dealer and is going to talk from that perspective. And David Hooten, who's the Forestry Commission deer officer um, for the East and East Midlands. And I'm Dr. Maurice Charlton. I'm the chairman of the Yorkshire branch, chairman of the England Wales Area Council, and also a trustee director. So welcome everyone, wherever you are. I hope we have someone from overseas who is listening in. Um, and what I'm going to do is I'm going to ask our panelists to give a little resume of their position um, and their knowledge of the deer market and venison market as it stands at the moment. And the first one into the foray is going to be Will Oakley. So over to you, Will, for five minutes, thank you. Okay, yeah, good evening. A quick, my background. Um, I started life as a gamekeeper many years ago, passionate about shooting and country sports. My hobby soon became my career. I started a small game processing company on the Shropshire Welsh border, which I run for many years. I am now operations director of that company, Willow Game, which is now quite a large processor owned by a group of like minded, passionate individuals. We now process approximately 1 million wing game and about 10,000 deer per annum. Uh, my role this evening is to represent the National Game Dealers Association, which I'm the vice chairman, which is 25 processor members based in the UK. The main aim within that group is to regulate members, share any information such as the FSA standards, uh, the inspection frequencies, and keeping up to date with the current legislation within that basis. It is our aim as a group to get safer food to a wider audience. I am here this evening to answer any questions that may be posed with regarding the sale of deer carcasses in the process. Thank you. Okay, thanks, okay, Will. Thanks, Will. Um, I wonder, uh, Dave, would you like to um, give your little praise? Um, of your position and what you're doing and uh, your understanding of the venison market. Yes, thank you, Morris. Good evening, everyone. Uh, thank you for inviting me here this evening. I've, I feel very fortunate, really. I've been involved in the deer industry now for just on 30 years. And during that time, been involved at sort of all levels, both at the stalking end, working for the forestry enterprise as it was back in the 1990s, and moving through the Deer Initiative and now back with the Forestry Commission as an independent, well, as an advisor to, to the sector. It's been challenging times over the last few years. Uh, I remember back in 2008, I was working in the east of England here, looking at venison marketing at that stage. And we set up the East of England Wild Venison Project in conjunction with the Forest Commission and the East of England Development Agency, pumping money in to help stimulate and maintain venison markets at that stage. It's been a fluctuating period of time. We've had highs and we've had lows over the last 40 or 50 years. We're in a massive trough at the moment. We've had coronavirus over the last eight months, sitting at four or five months, which really has not helped us. Restaurants have been closing and hotel trade is next to nothing at the moment. So we're in a position now where we've got imports coming in from Poland and the European Union. We've got New Zealand wild venison coming, uh, farmed venison coming in. And that's a marketplace that there is a place for it alongside our English wild. And we need to balance it out. Somehow we need to work out where our next markets are and what we can be doing to support it. And that support across the sector is supporting the stalkers, the landowners, the AGHEs and the local producers. So one of the first roles we did within our new sort of deer officer roles was of established and facilitating the establishment of a wild venison working group 
and that's bringing the step together. So BDS, BASC, the NGO, the Game Dealers Association, and a couple of other independents are pulling together to look at where the situation is currently, look at some of the gaps in the sector, and look at how we can work together to support the whole industry, to ensure that deer are managed across our countryside, to meet the government objectives of increasing woodland area, protecting our natural resources of ancient so many natural woodlands, and developing this cooperative approach across these areas to support the fact that deer are here to stay, but that in a lot of areas we do need to reduce this growing population. The venison is a byproduct as I see it, it's a byproduct of its essential management and it needs to be sold at local levels, it needs to be sold through wholesalers, it needs to be sold through the HHEs and the, the mass producers. That market, I think, is in the UK. There's a good market here. Local sales are good at the moment. Internet sales are good. The main blockage is this wholesale market. It's where we're getting larger volumes stuck in the, it's stuck in the chain. That, I think, will open up as we get the restaurants and hotel trades open again in the future, over the next few months. But there's gonna be a slow time lag to this. And I think we all need to be slightly patient with, with the price that we're getting at the moment and the way we see the sector growing. So through the Wild Venison Working Group, we've got a meeting tomorrow afternoon with the uh, Department of International Trade. And that's gonna be an interesting meeting. We're looking at how we can support the export of our wild venison into new marketplaces. And it's something that I'm working with the game dealers on at the moment and trying to bring these parties together to develop something that is a trusted product. The trusted product aspect is really important to local consumers, national consumers, and certainly the international market. And I see it as being a sort of fundamental part of what we do in the future, of making sure our venison is branded in a way that people recognise. And we're working with a group called Grown in Britain at the moment to look at brand future production of wild venison in the UK to bring it together under something that people recognize and have confidence in. So that's part of what we're looking at. The other part is obviously looking at other byproducts and looking at how we utilize the whole carcass. Pet food is a growing industry. More and more dogs and pets have been bought over the last few months. People are walking their dogs in the countryside. Okay, that conflicts a little bit with some of the stalking we need to do in the deer management, but there is a product there that we can help feed the, these animals with. And the, the vet pet food industry is a sector that has a growing trade. So there's a lot to be done over the next few months. We're working on it, we're working together, and we value the support of the partners within this project, and we value the support and knowledge that we have from the sector itself. But one of the things I would say is that we need to make sure that we maintain the quality and professionalism of the whole sector. And that starts with the stalkers on the ground, the landowners we're all working for. And also make sure that what we're producing is that quality product that people want to eat. We are dealing with a food product here. There are qualities and registrations that we have to go through. Make sure we're conforming to legislation and register premises where required. We'll touch on this just now. The food standards are consulting on the World Game Guide at the moment. They are requiring that consultation to be finished by the 11th of September. And that is what will be guiding our sector going forward, whether you're a local producer or whether you're working to feed your carcasses into the HHEs and the national game processors. So work with us, work together, and we're here to answer your questions in the next few minutes. Thank you. Thank you, David. That's um, really clear. I, th I think the very strong message there of uh, working together and working in partnership and collaboration. Um, I think um, you're absolutely quite right there that you highlight we're in a COVID-19. We're also in a, a period, whichever way you um, uh, veer of uh, a Brexit, um, which is going to set up new uh, challenges for international trade, but we're also being predicted to have a, a fair old recession. So these are going to be stormy times, difficult times and challenging times. And I suspect um, the, the, the simplistic answer to this is that very tight commitment of working together and forging new partnerships to make things work. So th there's nice connectivity with uh, Will and David there. If I can now pass on to you, Glyn, um, if you'd like to give your perspective, which is British Deer Society, and also your uh, perspective from the industry. Thank you. 
Thanks, Morris. Thanks, guys. Um, thank you, everyone, for joining us. Yeah, my name is Glenn Ingram. I'm the Deer Officer for the British Deer Society. And prior to taking on this role for the BDS, I was a, uh, I had a career as a stalker and a park deer keeper for a number of estates in the UK. I've also undertaken contract work for various organisations. Um, my role in the society involves training, consultancy, advisory work, and answering inquiries at all levels, from the most basic, uh, you know, member of the public contacting us to say, I've seen deer, what was it? To, to complex deer management questions. And, and at the moment, a significant number of those inquiries relate to venison. Um, I interact with many people in the deer sector from all sides. So all of them. Um, and I feel that I'm often in, between the boots on the ground, if you like, and the policy makers at the desk. So I get the useful insight there. Um, in the UK, and it, and it is worth mentioning that with regards to this webinar, I, I can only really speak for England and Wales. Um, we have, in my opinion, effectively three tiers of, of deer management. Firstly, the recreational school, um, and I class myself in that group these days. We shoot maybe a couple of deer a month, uh, quite often small deer, and they either eat them themselves or they sell them locally. And I know Graham's going to be speaking about that shortly, that opportunity to sell locally. Um, this group is probably the least affected by this crisis, but potentially has the easiest opportunity to change their market. So, so good for them. The second group are the estate and the professional or semi-professional stalkers who have significant numbers of deer to cull. Um, they're often dealing with larger deer in England, certainly pr primarily fallow deer, um, and they're often being required to meet cull targets. Their income has in the past often been directly linked to venison prices, and this is the group that are probably facing the greatest challenges. It's also the group that um, have over recent years been pushed very hard to increase culls, and now feel most let down by the current situation, if that's a fair phrase to use. Their work is clearly misunderstood by many, as we frequently see comments along the lines of, well, just eat the venison. Um, or if you can't eat it or can't use it, you shouldn't be shooting. I mean, they are clearly unrealistic statements to make. Um, very worryingly, I'm also hearing discussion from this group about the possibility of shooting to waste or disposal of disposal options for whole carcasses. So that's a, a major area of concern. Uh, the last group are probably employed wildlife rangers or managers for government or large organisations who may, as individuals or, or districts, be least affected, but they do contribute to the situation because they're putting large numbers of, of carcasses into the food chain. And, and it has been said that, that very often they're operating under nationally agreed prices, um, which does make it more challenging for others sometimes. My primary concern with regards to the venison price really is the impact this crisis will have on on deer welfare and, and, on, and on ongoing uh, deer and habitat management and, and of course safety goes along with that too. From the welfare side, there is a, a train of thought that says if, if my price per kilo is reduced to less than half the previous value, which was already low, um, then I need to shoot twice as many deer to, to get some sort of income. Um, with fallow especially, it was already very challenging to achieve a required goal. It's a short step to thinking, if I need twice as many deer, maybe I need to shoot twice as far. And that's a, a, a worrying situation. Um, on a similar vein, we have reports of some dealers dictating where animals are shot, um, which may encourage stalkers to operate outside their, their skill and confidence levels. Hopefully most are professional enough to handle that situation appropriately. Um, in terms of deer and habitat management, many people have worked very hard over the last few years to achieve coal targets and, and overcome major obstacles. You know, great steps forward have been made in terms of working together and, and breaking down some of the politics and local issues. Um, and I fear that we may be about to see some of that good work destroyed in one season. I, I hope I'm wrong. Um, I watch the venison markets. Morris touched on this earlier. I watch the venison markets and I, I note today that the top three supermarkets are all offering venison products. 
Wake traders source all of their venison from New Zealand. Sainsbury's claim theirs comes from UK parkland, farms and highlands, but may be supplemented by New Zealand and Europe. Okay. Yeah, okay. Tesco's claim to be all from one Scottish dealer, but the small print states UK and New Zealand. Many are questioning why the UK cannot furnish all of this home market. I mean, that market is really quite small anyway. Another little bit of research today. The average price for steak at those three big supermarkets is just under £30 a kilo. Burgers are around £12 a kilo. And only Waitrose, Waitrose is selling venison mince, which is surely the easiest thing to cook with and something that I think most game dealers would agree with. We generate quite a lot of um, that mince is fifteen pounds a kilo, and it's a hundred percent New Zealand venison. Interestingly, the reviews on the website from those three supermarkets are, are quite disappointing, with many comments about poor quality produce. Um, I've not seen the retail price drop in line with the darkest value. We, we must be as a as a sector, we must be having to do better than this. Another little anecdote. Um, my local restaurant has medallion, medallions of venison loin as a main course. It's absolutely lovely. Um, the price is £26 for that meal, which is more than I currently get for a whole fellow deal. Again, something is slightly wrong there. We do have an issue with standards. I have touched on this. Um, most stalkers are very good and take a pride in all aspects of their work, and I've seen some great improvements in that area over the last few years. So, well done to everyone for that. Um, but some are not so good, and we have to be honest and accept that. I do worry that as the price falls, standards may drop. But let's face it, it's human nature. If you're being paid less and less for something, you may well take less care of it. I hope I'm wrong. Um, for many years, I've heard the phrase, where do you get rid of your carcasses? Or where can I get rid of these carcasses? I absolutely hate that phrase, that term. Um, how can we demand good prices for our product when our mindset is to get rid of something? Um, there's a problem there. The standards thing works both ways. I hear a lot of comments from stalkers that, that say, you know, they, they go out of their way to produce good carcasses that they're proud of, only to watch dealers sling them in the back of a van alongside you know, much lesser quality animals, often untagged animals, and sometimes clearly out of season animals. Um, sometimes game birds as well, in the same heap in the back of the van. I hope that's uh, a rare occurrence. It certainly should be, but we should all ensure that we work to the highest standards. I think everyone would agree with that. Um, yeah, people. Have, I'm a bit of a sounding board. I, you know, people tell me things, and I, I repeat them. People are. I frequently say to me that if the price is going to be so low, the least that the dealers can do is to pay me on time, with many reporting delays of several months and possibly unreasonable deductions. Um, in the cases where that's true, and I know for a fact it isn't, it isn't everybody, so it mustn't tar the dealers with the same brush. Um, but in the in the cases where that's true, I can see their point. And if you sell a product, you do deserve to be paid for it appropriately and, and, and on time. Um, I'll just finish my little little talk with, with a couple of points. Uh, if you take away the value from something, then the wheels very quickly fall off. It doesn't matter what the subject is, it's a fact of life. If, if you take away the value for something, it's going to go wrong. Um, not sure what we can do about that. And, and just a final point, I hear people speculating about when will things pick up, or hoping that we're in a good position when things pick up. Um, personally, I can't see a light at the end of this tunnel. I hate to finish on a negative note, but I fear this is a situation that needs to be managed rather than resolved, and it'll be interesting to hear the other the other speakers' um, viewpoint on that. Thanks, guys. Probably waffled on a little bit too long there, Morris, but um, <coughs> thanks for the time.
Ah, fortunately, you didn't hear um, Nick Wout <laughs> ring me up there because I was <clears throat> muted. Um, but thank you, Glenn. Um, you've you've made some very strong points there and put down some challenges. You have highlighted the issue that it's about higher standards from everyone from that recreational stalker, which is a term I don't really like, but I know it's so often used to those professional people, um, right away through to the game dealers. Um, I hope that there are some politicians who are listening tonight, as opposed to barroom politicians, because I think there's a, a big message there that we have this high quality, welfare-based, ethically sourced um, animal and foodstuff that's coming through and we seem to be importing most of it and it's putting pressure on parks, it's putting pressure on butchers, it's putting pressure on game dealers and it's creating a difficulty for our own area. Now um, that links in really really nicely with Grain who is very much modestly the small-scale producer. So I wonder if you'd like to talk about how you are managing your um, venison market, uh, Grain. Uh, thanks, Morris. I'd be delighted. <clears throat> well, about 10 years ago, um, I was starting to considerably increase the number of deer that I was shooting. Um, and I also started at the same time to become thoroughly fed up with selling my excess carcasses to my local game dealer. Um, we have a farming business uh, and we were developing our flock of rare breed sheep. So it seemed a sensible thing to do uh, to register with my local authority as a food business so that I could sell both lamb and venison direct to local customers. Um, the registration side was straightforward. Um, it required an inspection by the Environmental Health Department and they have since made uh, one follow up uh, visit. Um, we had a redundant farm building that was suitable for conversion to a deer larder. So I put in a chiller uh, and I did uh, a basic conversion just to get myself going and to start butchering and processing. Um, I had already applied for funding from the East of England Wild Venison Project, which David mentioned a little earlier. Uh, that was quite a long time uh, coming through, but uh, I did in 2011 uh, get some uh, assistance from that project and that enabled me to buy some additional equipment such as a winch, uh, stainless steel work table, labeling scales, a vacuum sealer uh, and to upgrade all the internal dressing out and decoration of the larder. Um, so there's quite a lot of investment that I think that's needed to do the job properly. So last season I put 75 carcasses through the larder mostly munchak and Chinese, uh, but a few fallow, uh, the odd row, and one red deer. Um, for the smaller species, I do all my own butchery. I usually break the carcasses down into haunches, loin fillets, and four quarters, which I dice, and flank, which I mince. Um, I'll butcher a few fallow for sale, but any excess fallow, I sell to the game dealer in the fur. Getting rid of skins and bones is really important. Uh, and as a hunt supporter and a livestock farmer, I have a very good relationship with our local hunt kennels. So I can take bins of butchery waste for disposal. All my venison is vacuum packed and neatly labeled. Uh, my labeling scales print off a label with the name and address, details and weight. And that's all part of the presentation, which is really, really important. The packs have got to look good. They've got to have the same appeal that the customer would expect of something they bought at a shop. So I use blood stock to present, uh, to present all the fillets and steaks so that the packs don't cloud with blood when they're sealed. Everything then goes into a freezer. I simply don't know when the next customer is going to turn up. So it makes sense uh, to have everything frozen so that it's immediately available. We advertise at the farm gate uh, and I have quite a number of customers who simply turn up and ask for venison. But the greater proportion of our meat is sold at the local farmer's market. We've invested in point of display display material um, and a mobile chiller display unit. Now that was quite expensive, uh, but it's worthwhile. And I really enjoy standing alongside it once a month and explaining to local people about the wild meat from this part of Suffolk. Our catch line is that wild venison is the most natural red meat available, the flavor of the countryside. I believe there's really huge local interest in venison. 
Um, and I make a point of not just selling uh, a generic meat, but of promoting muntjac, roe, fallow, etc., etc. Um, there are a lot of muntjac in this area, and people are aware of them. And they've often heard that the meat is good, so they're usually very keen to try it, especially if the muntjac have been raiding their gardens um, when it becomes, I think, a bit of a revenge kick. But once they've tried it, they usually come back for more. Um, I've also started to work with a local restaurant, which mostly wants whole haunches of muntjac and fallow. Of course, that's been really difficult over the last few months, uh, and it's also been a real problem that the indoor farmer's market has been closed. Um, however, I think that there have probably been more people buying from the farm gate, and that, to some extent, balances things out. Hopefully, we'll get back to normal uh, with the farmer's market during the course of the next season. Um, I've always butchered down fallow haunches into steaks. Um, I'm now doing the same with the larger muntjac haunches. And a decent sized muntjac haunch will make seven steaks. And I find the, these little nuggets of meat are much more saleable than whole bone-in haunches of about 1.1 or 1.2 kilos. It's quite a lot of fiddly work, uh, and I can understand why game dealers don't want to bother with Munchak. Um, but um, if you make the effort to do it, you can turn a carcass that you might get a five or four from the game dealer into something that people really want to buy. So if you're shooting a few, if you're shooting a few deer, um, then I would really recommend local venison sales through the hunter exemption that's provided for in the wild game meat regulations. All you have to do is put in a little bit of investment and get that food business registration and you'll find it really rewarding selling the meat that you yourself have shot, butchered and processed. Thanks, Maurice. That's what I've got to say. Thank you very much indeed. And that, that helps the, um, the smaller, um, as Glenn put it, the recreational stalker. I think one of the things that's coming out there from uh, the conversation that Glenn had was about high standards of um, uh, expertise from the stalkers, but also from yourself there. Um, I said um, a modest, smaller scale trader, um, but also high standards of butchery and presentation skills. And that's perhaps something that um, we could mark in for BDS, for members, for training um, and for support. It, it might be an area that we need to develop as if we develop um, that smaller um, local market. Just before we go on to Nick, I wonder, Will, um, what your perception is of that sort of smaller scale market? Thank you, Graham. You need to unmute. Just at the bottom of the screen. Okay, we've got a. Oh, no, got it. Um, okay, now, yeah. You're with us, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Just from from the the dealer's perspective, we're all for that. We do not want all the deer in the country brought into the AJTs. We're quite happy. Um, you know, for the likes of Graham and all those guys, get yourself licensed, do yourself a nice, nice premises. And what we're all aiming to achieve is supply good quality, safe food. And, and we're all for that. All the dealers that I'm speaking to are quite up for that. If you are producing a good product and you're, you've got the legislation in place, which obviously uh, you know, Graham has and many more have. We are all for that. We're promoting that. Let's reduce the food miles for sure. Okay, thank you. Thanks. I just wanted to get your perspective on that while it was still hot. And if we can now come to our final um, presenter of the night, um, Nick. If you'd like Good to. Good evening. Uh, I'm Nick Rouse. Yeah. Good evening. I'm Nick Rouse, a trustee director of British Deer Society. England Wales Area Council Vice Chair, Branch Chair for East Anglia Branch of BDS and sit on the Wild Venison Working Group. I shot my first deer 36 years ago. I mention that because when I sold the deer back then, I was being paid a pound a pound or £2.20 a kilo. 
Over the last 20 years, I've have become more involved in managing fallow in East Anglia, where we have a very healthy supply of deer. I recover my expenses via the sale of carcasses. Through my chiller based at home, I move on between four and six tonnes of carcasses per year. In addition to this, recently I've done some work as a contract culler, being paid for each animal culled. Recreational professional culling doesn't really make a great deal of difference. If you're shooting 10, 100 or 1,000 a year, this still makes a huge contribution to the overall cull. But most stalkers don't have an endless pot of finances to allow them to continue this work, in some cases, every spare moment of their lives to complete the cull, set by landowners or leasehors. These same stalkers have mostly been these same stalkers have mostly been asked to jump through many hoops to satisfy the landowners or leasehors in the form of showing due diligence through training. The deer management qualifications level one and two, along with first aid, manual handling, quad bike riding qualifications, amongst other targets we set ourselves to be competent. Add to the list of training undertaken, those who have previously or still do supply game dealers have had to register with their local council to allow a legal supply of carcasses in the skin. I'd like to take a moment to look at the cost of culling. By this, I refer to the individuals who are shooting more than they could ever eat or give away. Have undertaken the correct training and registration with the local council. Add to this the expense of running a suitable vehicle, towing a trailer with a quad bike. As anyone knows who has shot any number of fallow, you'll always drop five or six at last light in the furthest, wettest part of the estate that you're not going to reach in your wife's Ford Focus. These are essential. Put on that the insurances, running a chiller for eight months of the year, and not forgetting running the rifle. Bullets, but as we move towards non-toxic, are over three pound per shot. You start getting an idea of where we are. Personally, I take great pride in the carcass I prepare. From the moment I've confirmed death, it's all about producing a quality carcass. It's food at that point, and I know every other stalker feels the same way and has great respect for the culled animal. So what now? Yesterday evening, a friend informed me of a game dealer paying 77 pence per kilo. This for a 50 kilogram carcass, that last year, at this time, was worth maybe 140 pounds. Now, only worth 38 pounds 50. Let's hope he doesn't get deducted 20% for two damaged shoulders or worse. When we get to the doe season, and a 25 kilo carcass returns under 20 pound, it's wet, muddy, cold or snowing, you may not feel the same level of commitment. I, like many others who rely upon the income stream from venison, will be looking for alternative markets. This will mean registering at the next level with the local council, allowing me to skin and cut up carcasses, then sell directly to my local pubs and restaurants. From my perspective, if I allow £20 to skin it, another £20 to cut it up, package it, deliver it, or get my wife to whilst I'm out culling more, add the price I was once getting of £2.80 per kilo, I only need £110 in total for that 25 kilo carcass. That's a minimum of £4.40 per kilo for the same deer. Yes, I'll have to work hard for the same return, but what else do I do? Not to mention the pubs were pretty pleased to be getting the meat at this rate. Don't get me wrong, I really do not want to be a butcher, but I do have to make a living. In the absence of a viable market for these carcasses, what do I do? Thank you. Okay, thank you. Um, it's it's interesting, um, Nick, that I was just looking at the shooting times uh, recently, and uh, that had culling and wasting, or not culling at all, um, with a strap line of without the ability to sell the carcasses, the deer management system can't function. Um, that inevitably would have quite an impact upon um, the habitats and uh, the plans for uh, the plantations um, on quite a vast scale that the government is um, initiating. We have had a significant number of um, questions that have come in. And while we've got Will and perhaps Nick with those comments and Graeme um, on screen at the moment, I've got a question from Stuart Bright. And he asks two questions. Should we look to creating a local cooperative to try and provide local and independent retailers with a regular supply? Could the BEDS create a forum for members to form cooperatives and aid marketing? 
Is that something that's feasible? Or is that something that we have to look at this COVID recession, Brexit challenging period of time, think out the box and come up with something as perhaps radical as that? Who would like to have the first punt at that? Graeme, thank you. You're muted. You're muted. Can you hear me now? Thank you. We got you now. Okay. Okay, that's good. Um, the point about a cooperative, I, I, there would obviously need to be a responsible food business operator, a single food business operator, because the, the operation has, has got to uh, has got to work within the legislation. Um, so I'm just wondering if the best plan uh, might be to form a, a hub uh, with a number of stalkers supporting a central operator and maybe sharing the profits in, in some way. Or sharing, I mean, profits is maybe maybe the wrong word, but returns anyway. Um, and maybe they would also contribute to the setup and running costs of the larder and butchery operation. Bearing in mind that the uh, person who's registered with the local authority would ultimately have the responsibility. So rather than a cooperative, you know, I can see the thing operating as a. a maybe as a, as a central hub with people feeding into it. Um, that's a suggestion anyway. Okay, thanks, Graeme. Um, Nick? Um, I, I agree, really. really. It's a, a hub is a good idea, but it's you know, as long as the hub is not just seemingly another way for an, the next level up to make more money because they haven't got to actually run around and get it from various different small places. Yep. It, it's it's interesting that um, Stuart actually highlights um, to form a cooperative and aid in marketing, which would be something different from for the British Deer Society. But I, I wonder if um, it'd be interesting to also get the, the perspective of Dave Hooten, but you're on the Venison uh, Marketing Group as well, Nick. I wonder if it would be feasible um, for this to be joint and across organisations working in partnership with NGO and um, Basque. I can see Will's put his hand up there. Any views on that, uh, Nick? Uh, it's certainly something that has been, is, is being looked at. Um, but I think it's, it, that is something that's more down to the individual stalkers. So maybe we will see something coming forward. Yeah. If Perhaps. Will wants to have a word and make himself mute. Okay, Will, you just need to unmute. Real. Yeah. Um, all I'd like to add to that really is, as we're all aware, you know, that the low prices that we've got at this moment are a direct reflection of market conditions. COVID and HRC sector being closed for many months. A big percentage of the venison, whether it comes from our, our skies, whether it comes from the dealers, into wholesalers is, is ending up in retail restaurants um, and the lower trim value stuff would be going to burgers and sausages that would be ending up in shows the hospitality sector um, and, and I would say that at the moment there is probably if I said within the the industry, there's probably something like 10 million pounds worth of venison in stock. I mean, I, I think the guy who sent the question, I appreciate the question, but do we just want to have a look? Do we honestly need to start running around to reinvent the wheel when there is a market for venison, but at this moment in time, there is a blip? I, th I think that's what I'd like to just make clear. Okay, thank you. Uh, a point well made. Um, within um, Stuart's question, um, there, there isn't uh, that aid for marketing. Do you think there's um, perhaps some work that BDS could do or perhaps through the Venison Working uh, Group to provide advice, um, operational guidance for people who are working on this, Nick? Sorry, I was just dealing with technical issues aside here. <laughs> Um, say the question again, very sorry, but I was trying to get other things to work for this. Um, I'll have to rephrase that question because 
when I say something, I'm too spontaneous. I can never remember what I've said. Um, but um, Stuart had intimated that um, there might be some aids to help and guidance um, remarketing. Could that be something that the Venison Working Group um, could look at, um, operational guidance for people? Basically, a ABCD guide of how to do it. All I can say is, yes, we can look. Yeah. Um, I can't make promises. I can't say that as an individual I can make anything happen. Um, but, yes, we'll look. Um, Graham's just put his hand up. He may want to make a comment on that, but he's also on mute. So just make sure you unmute before you start speaking. <laughs> Thanks, Nick. You need to unmute, uh, Graham. Oh. Not only has it... Ah. <laughs> Hi, Graham. You need to unmute. You need to unmute. Okay, he can't unmute. Um, okay, then um, I'm uh, left with the panelists because I can't uh, bring or connect with some panelists here. Nick, uh, I'm going to um, talk to you um, and perhaps um, Will can uh, help out. I don't know whether Dave Hooten um, uh, can connect with us at the moment, but Stuart um, talks about food hy hygiene regulations and he talks about his local council being very helpful. Um, but he asks for, again, additional guidance um, and training about how to do this. Um, perhaps that's something that, again, could come through the Venison Working Group, working with the organizations that are part members of that group. Um, we don't cover it very often in any of the training that we do with the BDS. Perhaps it's something if members are particularly keen on that, um, we could think of introducing. Yes. Any comments? I, other than other than yes, it's it's all common sense. It would all help, um, and it's all help and ideas that can help get the whole industry back going. But I think you know. Also, as Will said, there is no end market at the moment. So whatever we do, we're slightly tied by it because of, because of the lack of market at the end. Graham's going to have another crack. Graham, yeah. Are you I think, I think I've got sound back now. I'm sorry, I lost that for, for a moment. Um, yeah, I think the one thing which, uh, which does scare people uh, is this question of um, registering as a food business with uh, local authority. And, it, you know, it, it, it wouldn't be difficult for BDS to maybe give step-by-step -step guidance on just how to do it. I mean, it's not difficult. It really isn't difficult. Um, there, are, there are a number of steps that need to be taken, and there are a number of things which you've got to, uh, uh, got to bear in mind and understand and learn and achieve in order to, uh, uh, you know, to, to, to get accredited. Um, obviously, you need to have the, um, you know, your larder needs to be up to scratch. Your processing facilities uh, need to be uh, uh, sensible. But it's not difficult, and I, and I'm sure that uh, more people would do it and would consider it if the if the BDS were were able to hold their hand. Okay, thank you. That's um, a, an interesting um, perspective and and point of view. Um, I'm just interested. We've lost Glyn for a moment, um, so uh, the pressure is on the guys who are on screen at the moment. Uh, well, Will, have... Will did just have his hand up to pass a comment on that. Will, would you like to comment on that? Once he's off, me, off of mute. This is coming off of mute's hard work. Can you, can you hear me, Morris? I can hear you loud and clear, Glenn. We're just waiting for Will um, to come off mute. We seem to be having difficulty in coming off mute. Will's just got a, um, a comment um, to make there. Which, unfortunately, we don't seem to be getting. Um, Glyn, can you hear me? Yeah, I can hear you, Morris. I, I wonder if you'd like to pass any comments on some of the questions that we've had. Um, the questions relate to food hygiene um, training and also um, uh, BDS giving guidance towards how we market um, deer. Is that something that you think we could um, uh, 
dip our toes into or do you think that is something that could perhaps be a product or a push through the um, venison working group yeah i mean very much so i'm i don't personally sit on the venison working group nick nick represents the society there um and i know he's he, he's fully up to speed with with all that but yeah it would be no real difficulty to produce some guidance notes as as graham has said many people are unnecessarily frightened of the process uh the wild game guide which the, the food standards agency wild game guide is is under review but even as it stands at the moment it's it's actually a very good document and uh, particularly the flow chart that that is within it I, i'm frequently uh referring people to that it, it explains very clearly what you can do and what you need to do it's, it's, a, it's a good piece of work so um yeah i urge people to, to look at that maybe we can uh, as british year society um, provide some guidance notes to to support that um certainly something we can look at very very good idea and a very useful outcome from this meeting already thank you um glenn it's, it's also interesting because we've got questions that were presented to us before the um, webinar, but we've also got, if I get the name correct, it's um, Siki Ludensvis, um, and talking about the way in which uh, venison is marketed. This has come in on the chat um, and pushing the uh, issue of it's ethically obtained venison um, to find a market, but also um, looking at marketing value and the different types of value that comes into it. Value as in an ethically sourced, welfare-based um, crop. Um, so that's just coming in on, on the um, feed um, uh, that we're getting at the moment um, from some of our listeners who are tuning in. Um, I wonder, um, I've got a specific question for you, Glenn. Um, and you were talking about the three layers of um, stalkers and workers. Um, the question for you is from Russell Downs, who's the wildlife officer at the Historic Royal Palaces. And the question is, how will estates and deer parks survive with the rising costs? For example, winter supplementary feeding that rely on venison sales to cover the bulk of the cost and other essential jobs and tasks. Now, we know this year was phenomenally wet and very difficult for the animals. And then we had a very warm spell where grazing has not been good. Um, do you think there's an existential issue that could emerge for some of those uh, estates and parks? Yeah, that's a that's a very good question from Russell there, um, and I, I think I'm in a reasonably good position to answer that as a as a former deer park keeper, um, and I'm sure Russell knows that way he would have posed the question. Um, the first thing I would urge all deer park keepers and, and owners and managers. Is do not fall into the trap of reducing your coal to fit your food budget, which is based on a reduced venison income, because that is a very quick circle of diminishing um, returns and a, and a spiral to the bottom. It's happened before where people have reduced their coals due to, to lower prices, and of course you then end up instantly, in, within one season, you end up with trying to feed more animals and they end up being lower quality animals with less money and less food. And that's a very, very bad idea. I'm sure most people are aware of that. So I just urge people not to hold back on culling for that reason. Um, to answer the actual question, how do we fund that winter feed and other, and other essential uh, requirements? Well, it's a tough one. All I can suggest is that, that professional people uh, that, that know what they're talking about and have the experience like Russell um, go to their employers and their managers and particularly when they're part of much bigger organizations go right to the very top and make the point that this is a potential crisis it's a potential welfare issue um, and the funding must be available and it must be made available and then ring fenced for winter feed or otherwise we'll have a um, a crisis. It's always difficult to budget for winter feed anyway. Who knows how long the winter's going to be? There could be snow in, in April. Um, it's always been tricky. The last point I would make on that, and I have seen some zoos and wildlife parks doing this at the very start of lockdown, um, 
particularly for those part uh, charitable trusts, which there are quite a number, they may wish to consider crowdfunding or, or appeals or just giving uh, type options for actually asking the public for money for winter feed. And um, that may be a that may surprise people to hear me say that, but it's a it's a thinking outside the box idea. Um, probably less suitable for straightforward businesses or estates, but for anyone that's got a charitable aspect or an educational aspect to their to their property, uh, it could be an option. Okay, thank you, Glenn. Um, we've we've had a feed coming in. Um, uh, from the chat line um, and someone's asked the very basic question is why are our supermarkets taking New Zealand venison and not taking British venison and why is there so much of it coming into the country and I think Will is probably the most appropriate to answer that. <laughs> uh, not speaking for myself as a company because we do not buy any, any New Zealand or Spanish venison, we, we support English venison, UK venison, that's all we sell. But as an industry, there is a lot of New Zealand brought in because the supermarkets are demanding full traceability. They want to know the age of the beasts. They want the ear tag of the beast when it was killed. They want all the cuts to be within a few grams of each other. And, and I'm just speaking for the industry as a whole. That is the reason people are buying New Zealand. I'm not saying I agree with it, but the reason that they are is because it is very good quality venison. They're all like peas in a pod. They're all the same price. And at the moment, the price is very, very competitive. But I will say we do not buy any foreign venison within our company. Okay, thanks. Thanks, Andy. Because that's, that's sort of matched here with a kind of um, flag that's flying here. It's coming on a feed um, on the chat line. Rob 308 win. Um, commodities future markets indicate severe food shortages later this year. And we know there's been difficulties with the harvest. Uh, I know government is looking into that and into 2021. Price rises for beef might present an opportunity for um, the, the local market. And it's how agile we can be um, in this sector of industry to take advantage of that. Um, similarly, um, I'm, I'm picking up a theme that's running through a significant number of the questions um, that comes through, which is about the timeline for when we might have some stability in the market. I've got that from um, a Mr. Lehman. I've got it from um, a Mr. McAndrew. I've got it from a, a, a Mr. Gibbs. Um, I've got it from Andy Massingham as well. Um, a theme about when is it going to end and when is the market going to stabilize now that's an over generalization of some of those points but um i think we've answered that so i won't address all of those questions um together um there's a, an interesting uh, issue from uh, and, and again this might be local patches um simon greenwood um highlights the quantity of poached deer contributing to low prices um that might be something that glenn or andy uh, or Will might um, have some uh, perspective on. Will first, perhaps? Could I just say, when the venison prices are low, the poaching, there is no poaching. Because when the prices are high, when uh, the deer carcasses early last year were £2.80, £3 a kilo, there possibly could have been some poaching. Can I just remind everyone, look at Facebook, look at get your websites, that's where a lot of your deer are ending up. They could not come into an approved game hand establishment without seeing their DSC level one or their large game handling certification. Uh, poached deer will be ending up into your restaurant. I would almost guarantee that. Not what you think, Nick. Morris, can, can you still hear me? I can hear you, Glenn. Can't see you, but I can hear you. Go okay. ahead. Um, yeah, I can. I can support what Will's just said. You know, the, the, the poaching certainly of large deer uh, is, is significantly linked to the venison price and to seasonality. So we all see a spike in the run up to Christmas of, of illegally sourced deer. Uh, I actually hate the term poaching. It, it conjures up this idea of some poor oppressed Victorian peasant feeding his family. Um, we all know that's not the case. We're talking about 
wildlife crime and the firearms offences and, and usually linked to other rural criminality. So, you know, that's a serious factor in itself without just the venison side of things. Um, so, yeah, I support what, what Will says there. There is the other aspect of, of poaching, which is not necessarily the uh, for the sale of venison, but, but you know, for sport, for want of a better word. So um, all, I, all I would say there is just to urge everybody to report any rural crime, because very often they are, they are linked to one another. So, you know, I often hear people say, what's the point in reporting it? The police never do anything. What's the point in ringing 101? You can never get through. Um, all I would say is there is a point to it. Please report every rural crime you are aware of. Uh, and, and only by doing that can we, can we try and curtail that. Thanks, Lynn. That's a really good point. If I could just do a promo here, because there is um, um, the poaching app, which is um, free, um, which you can get, which works and is very functional. Um, and it's Project Poacher. Um, and if you can download that, then you can um, log the necessary details uh, with everybody. It's a free app. So Project Poacher, um, please download. Nick, you were waving your hand, sir. Yeah, perhaps it's time that we, as an industry, looked at a better tagging system. So we have two forms of tags, as well as having a tag which we fill in all the details of the species, sex, and numbers and signatures. Along with that tag, there is a ear tag type thing which you get for cattle, which could go through the flank of the beast, which would stay with it throughout its production. And as much as when that is supplied to a pub, the pub has to retain that tag. And in hand with that, maybe it's time that the environmental health officers were actually targeting the pubs and looking at where they're getting their food from in a lot more robust way than they are at the moment. Because it just seems to me, yeah, maybe we get it from mate down the road. And that's it. There's no more questions asked. Perhaps they ought to start actually pressurising the pubs and saying, you need to have this on. Because if you don't have this paperwork, we're starting to drop your stars and your star rating system because that's not healthy food. Yeah, and that, that picks up with one of the points of one of our people in the chat line about ethically sourced, um, welfare-based uh, animals. Um, again, we, we keep coming back to um, uh, costing here, and this might might be more applicably um, responded to by Will or perhaps um, Graeme. Um, why is the price of why is the retail price of wild venison so much higher than our reared beef and lamb? Shall I start? Yes, please. The, the price, the prices at the moment. I think everybody's got to remember at the moment. We have just started our new season of venison on the first of August or first of July in Scotland. But the prices of venison that we're buying now, remember, we are selling last year's quite expensive stock. We are still selling that, and that is one of the reasons that the venison is still quite high with the retailers. Um, although, as an industry, we are now dropping the prices of wholesale prices. You will be seeing the wholesale prices coming down, but that will not necessarily reflect into retail because the retail prices are quite high. Uh, and that is the same, really, as if you see a lamb going to auction. You, you're a farmer, you go and see your lamb in auction. Why are you getting a hundred pound for your lamb when it costs you forty-five quid for a leg of lamb? That is generally in the industry because the retailers are making quite a lot of money, or need to make a lot of money out of that product. There is not there is a lot of difference when it comes into us with the carcass of what we have to pay before it gets to retailers. But that that is one of the reasons. Okay, thanks, thanks, Will. Anyone else want a perspective on that? You'll have to unmute, Graeme. You'll have to unmute. Mm. It's not working. It is his end. It's unmuting. Morris, can you hear me still? I can hear you, Glenn, yes. Okay, just maybe while um, Graeme's sorting out his, his microphone, Maybe I could just pose a, a quick question to Will, and it does come back to um, one of the things I, I mentioned in my 
preamble. Um, why is, I mean, I'm intrigued to know why mints is not a product that we see, red venison mints is not a product that we see in our supermarkets. I, I, I eat venison mints three times a week, um, obviously my own home produced, but it seems such an obvious solution. Why, why are we not seeing more of it? I would say the answer to that, we sell quite a lot of mints. In fact, we've just done quite a big order to Country Food Trust for mints. With the MOD, we do a lot of mints. Um, and mints is, as you say, the easiest to produce. It's used in the lower value stuff, and it is very good. The only thing I may say is that some of the technical people within the supermarket, as you're all aware, miss mints becomes high risk. Mints must be stored at less than two degrees where the rest of your stuff would be less than four. Mints is quite a high risk. And in a lot of cases, the retailers will not take that risk. But I agree, it is a very, very good one. Yeah, thanks, Will. That's, um, you know, that is something I was aware of, and I'm always pushing the, the risk aspect. And, and it is worth mentioning here and reiterating to the, to our viewers that, you know, sometimes that. The, we must we must be careful not to be a victim of our own enthusiasm, and uh, it is easy to sell the highest risk produce to to high risk uh, groups. You know, we want we want families, we want young children to eat venison. Um, interestingly, we also always promote not overcooking venison. I, I say that to someone every day: do not overcook venison. And and as we all know, cooking a product correctly and appropriately is is key to, to food hygiene in the kitchen. So, yeah, valid point there, Will. Thanks. Okay. Perhaps some other opportunities for training there. Um, it's um, unfortunate that we seem to have lost Dave Hooten. Um, I don't know whether he can still hear us because um, I have a question that's, um, again, come about, um, about management and about managing deer um, uh, from Frank Byrne. Um, and he asks us, with many leases and permissions made affordable by selling carcasses, is there any way we can ask for leases forestry companies to allow accompanied stalking with a paid member so as to share the burden of cost? For example, if a site has six tenants with a clause that only members can attend, can we get that changed to plus one within the control of the paid member? This would allow leaseholders to bring a friend, share costs, and maybe open new experiences to the wider stalking community. And I think there there's an issue about sharing costs, sharing expenditure. Um, I wonder, Glyn, if that's one that's most appropriate to you and perhaps as the professional colour um, for you, Nick, as well. Yeah, I'll, I'll just, I'll try and answer as, as best as I can on behalf of David. But the way I understand it is that the Forestry Commission leases um, part of the insurance schemes and the way things work and the way their management works is that only the people who are cleared to shoot on that ground can shoot on that ground, having proven that they're capable of doing the shooting. And that is something that the managers of the ground need to see themselves, not just down to the person who's leasing the ground. Okay, thank yeah. you. I, I can pick up where, where Nick leaves off there, uh, Morris, and you know, it's a, it's a very good question from Frank. Uh, Nick's answered it hopefully from the Forestry Commission uh, angle, which probably also covers some of the major uh, landowners and forestry companies. With regard to the smaller ones, where you might have more chance of negotiating directly with an owner or an agent. Um, yeah, it's down to, down to the individual to, to negotiate uh, those situations. And, and the more he can put in place that, that reassures him that, that all the due diligence is covered, then all power to him. Um, the one thing I would say, and I'm, I know for a fact right, uh, Frank will be aware of this, but maybe, maybe others might not be, uh, we, you might need to be careful that whilst taking a guest out, does give an increased income stream it 
will almost certainly, and I mean no disrespect from this, but it will almost certainly reduce your ability to achieve your curl just by the simple fact that two people wandering through the woods make more noise than one person does, irrespective of that, that guest's experience. So um, sometimes what gives you one hand takes away with another. Okay, thanks, Glenn. Um, we know that um, the vast majority of people are now living in urban areas, and um, I think this might be one for Will um, in particular, but uh, Gray might be able to comment on this as well. Um, it's a question that's posed by Ben McAndrew. And for city dwellers without direct access to a reputable butcher, um, court cases uh, pending there, what is the best way to source good quality venison for a reasonable price directly to the consumer? There seem to be several options online, but the quality varies distinctly from my experience, and it seems to be inconsistent. Also, it seems difficult to specify particular species. Could we suggest any reputable UK only suppliers, please? And why are we not selling venison in urban areas apart from in supermarkets? Gosh. Thanks, Will. Um, dare I say Willow Game? Oh, no, I didn't say that. Um, yeah, I, th I think there are loads of reputable suppliers out there. You know, we're, we're, we're doing a mail order, there's lots of companies doing a nice mail order service and you know i mean and quite often it's a case of asking your local butcher go into your local butcher and ask does he stop venison and is there any reason and they will contact you know your ag to or whatever and they will there is just ask and that venison is available for sure um you know as i say we have a website all the guys members of the national game Meal association have a website which they will sell direct um, but certainly go into your local butcher and, and ask him or your farm shop, do they stock it? Um, and, and, you know, self-promote that, you know, go in there and ask them. And, because if they're not being asked for that venison, chances are that's the reason they're not stocking it. And that that would be my, that would be my idea. Okay, thanks, uh, Will. Uh, Nick, uh, Graham. Uh, thanks, Morris. Um, there are a lot of a lot of people that are selling selling this uh, uh, on the internet, and of course, um, the uh, game, the wild game regulations enable you to sell uh, on the internet well beyond your immediate locality, and that it's a bit of a strange hiccup in in the in the legislation that, um, uh, although when you're selling direct to uh, the customer uh, in front of you. Um, you know, there is this uh, uh, restriction on local sales, but you can also sell on the internet. And of course, the internet goes far and wide, uh, far beyond your locality. Um, uh, and that's perfectly legal to do so. There are, and there are a lot of people that are selling on the internet. Um, and there's Thanks. some very good, uh, very good suppliers that are doing that. I mean, just to quote uh, one of my, my own local uh, 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 people, um, the, the wild meat company at Blacksall in Suffolk. Um, obviously, they're an AGHE. Uh, they're a very good uh, dealer, but they are supplying um, uh, excellent uh, uh, venison. They're supplying um, species-specific stuff like muntjac. Um, you know, and clearly, as a as an internet supplier, you can buy it wherever you wherever you are, whether you're in an urban area or or a or a rural area. I just wish to some extent that um, people uh, would be able to take um, wild venison into uh, urban areas. But of course, then, you know, you're, you're up against this small and local um, definition. I mean, I can't take mine out of Suffolk or I think it's 30 miles within Norfolk or Cambridgeshire. Um, not that I particularly want to, because all I want to do is to sell locally. Okay, thank you. Um, we're now coming up to um, perhaps our final questions um, and perhaps a summary of any comments that anyone might uh, want to make. But we, we do know, and uh, Will has already alluded to, um, venison going to um, uh, some charities. 
Um, there's a question from Andy Massingham in the Northwest branch. Has consideration been given to supplying schools or um, lower income families with subsidized supplies of venison to promote healthy eating? Now, I, I don't think Will can answer that one, nor can any of us, but it's perhaps something that um, when we're looking at um, moving food on, that it could be uh, put to DEFRA um, as, a, as a source of high quality food, um, particularly as we've um, got someone with a, a, an insight, um, previously was talking about um, food uh, hikes and food shortages. Um, and if we've got this surplus around, should it not be used in that better way? Um, I know that there are some charities who are using venison and game products um, uh, very, very positively and productively. Any comments? Okay. Um, well, we're coming up to our final time. It's just before um, quarter to nine, and we said we'd finish at 20.45. I wanted to finish on, on time because sometimes we can get um, webinars going into um, a bit of drift. Um, do we, does anyone have a particular final comment that they'd like to make? Will? Yeah, the only comment I'd like to make would be just for the stalkers out there, whether they're parks, estates or recreational stalkers, a solution. Um, I would encourage all those guys to start shooting the does in November. We are seeing the trend that the does are not being shot in November, December, January, whether it clashes with shooting seasons, gamekeepers are busy. I don't know the entire reason, but if I gave you, for instance, I bought a thousand saddles last year, the Christmas week, because I was I didn't have enough gear. We need, and if you want to shoot the does, there's too many bucks being shot. We've got a problem with all your recreational stalkers that are not shooting them unless they got antlers. Shoot the does from the 1st of November heavily. We need the deer November, December. Um, and that would be a big solution. And that has come from all, that is a comment that's come from all the dealers. Please shoot those deer November, December when we hopefully want them rather than coming to us in April and saying, I've got a lot of does eating my corn. Can I shoot them under section, section seven of the Deer Act? So shoot the does from the 1st of November would be the only thing I would say from the industry. Thanks, Will. Any other final comments? Yeah, to follow on from what Will has just said, I actually thoroughly agree with him. And, you know, if, if as a colour, you've got a landowner who's jumping up and down, screaming at you, but he wants more deer shot, Perhaps it would be a good thing to say to explain to him how we don't have a market at the moment. So rather than going out and shooting all the fat bucks, you're going to leave them alone and actually deal with some population management by shooting the does in November and December. Um, I'm also aware there's a lot of shoots this year who aren't releasing birds or aren't shooting at all. So all of those woods don't have the excuse that we don't want to disturb the birds this year. So let's get in there. Let's get the job done in November, December when hopefully the game dealers do have a market for us and we can help them. Hopefully they can help us and we'll all end up in a better place for it. Good. Okay. Can I, can I jump in, Morris, quickly? Yes, certainly, Glyn. Um, it sounds like a mutual appreciation society, but I, I agree with the last two speakers. Um, there's another factor to that, and I know David would support this heavily if he was still with us here. Um, of course, by shooting deer as early as possible in the season, you're reducing the woodland impact uh, or the impact on the woodland when it's at its most severe. So taking those those mouths off the ground early in the season is, is achieving you know, our conservation and our ecological aims too. Um, the last couple of points I'll make is, is to firstly thank everyone for joining us and, and just remind them that, you know, people like myself, David, our colleagues at the ASC, NGO, we're there at the end of a phone to talk to about these these issues and any inquiries that, that you have, you know, talk to us and we'll we'll help you get things right. Um, 
the final point I will make, I've seen it come up a number of times in the in the online comments. We don't have time to discuss it, but the issue of non-lead ammunition has come up a number of times. So I, I wouldn't want people to think we we're ignoring that issue. And it's it's clearly important to people. So something for another day. Um, yeah, that's that's me. Thanks, Morris. Thank you very much. Graham, do you want a final comment or are you happy with the Mutual Appreciation Society? Oh, he's muted again. <laughs> he loves mute. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Um, well, thank you very much. First of all, um, if I can just pick up a point from Glyn, um, we said this was the first of a series of webinars and we would be looking at um, setting up a webinar um, looking at um, lead and copper. That is one of the um, uh, things that we will be uh, doing in the future, we hope. Um, the second thing is, is to reassure all of those people who sent in questions um, that the panel have got copies of all of those questions and that they haven't been ignored. And secondly, we have been taken um, notice of all the online feeds that we're getting in, and the issues and questions that have been raised um, there. Um, now, before I forget, because um, the panel have been incredibly informative and helpful, um, and I hope supportive and insightful and informative, and are going to set the debates going, um, but behind the scenes, we've had Laura McMahon, who's been making everything work with a new system. And some of you out there will have known that there have been some problems, some drop offs, some uh, hiccups in the system. This is the first time we've done this. Um, and I know that Laura will be determined to get it right. But the amount of work she has put in to make it work for the society members is enormous. So thank you very much, Laura. You are the unseen hero here. Um, I'd also just like to thank um, Rory Putnam, who was going to um, be with us tonight and help us. Um, but um, we couldn't quite manage that. So thanks to Rory and to everyone else who provided the backup um, for the team. I'd like to finally say to, um, to Dave, um, who unfortunately we lost, to Glyn, to Graeme, to Nick and to Will, thank you very much indeed for putting your head over the parapet, for being brave enough to talk. Um, there's plenty of opportunity for us to pick up. This, I hope, has been a learning opportunity for our audience. It's certainly, I think, been a learning opportunity and a good sounding board for us. There's certainly some lessons that we might be able to take back for training in the future and for improving best practice and for getting a consistent message out. 